Okay, so yeah, we'll talk about that. Uh, but right now we've got public comment. Um, this is the March 17, 6.30 p.m. meeting of the uh, Rockport Planning Board. And um, we've got our first public comment period. We have one at the beginning of the meeting and one at the end of the meeting. And anybody out there can comment on matters relating to planning. Um, and uh, so please, uh, you've got to raise your hand and Kelsey will call on you and then um, you'll have your, you know, you'll be able to talk about what you want to talk about. Okay. Okay, first up, I have Toby Arsenian. Toby, you're unmuted. Thank you. Uh, Toby Arsenian, 95 Granite Street. Uh, I listened in on your uh, workshop meeting with the Board of Appeals yesterday. Uh, it was very frustrating. You could not hear most of what Alan Battistelli, one of the chief actors, was saying. Um, so much for, uh, no, no insult to Kelsey Schmink, but so much for Zoom. Uh, I had hoped to comment on the, uh, the coastal flame, plain flood zoning. Um, but and raised my paw but was not recognized uh the chairman's discretion but i feel a mistake if anyone takes the trouble to listen in uh it would be kind and polite and conceivably to your benefit to hear whatever uh might be offered um i'm distressed looking at the coastal floodplain zoning i think that what you or mapc have done with it and also uh what alan battistelli is proposing don't come anywhere near fixing it. I, I think the whole thing needs to be uh, rewritten from scratch. And I'm asking you to withdraw that section just as you withdrew the watershed section, which I gather you're working on with Eric Hutchins and bring it forward to the fall. And if you see fit to do so, um, I'd be glad to help. I, you may not think I'm capable, but perhaps I am. Uh, if you give me the relevant papers, please consider it. No, no, that's, and thank you, Toby. That's, uh, we will definitely consider that. Um, that's one of the things we want to talk about. Uh, and we're going to, I just kind of giving you a preview. We are going to talk about having a special meeting next week to discuss the things that were discussed that just among us, not, not necessarily with the CBA, but just among the planning board to discuss the points raised at the meeting last night and see how we want to go with those. So uh, that is definitely something we will talk about. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, anyone else that want to comment at this point? Okay. Uh, if anyone else wants to speak, you can click the hand raise function or the raise hand function or wave around on your camera. Not seeing anyone, Mr. Chair. Okay, good. So then we'll proceed to the next um, item, which is the um, approval of the minutes that Kelsey so kindly got us done um, on time from January 6th and January 20. Um, I have to confess, I haven't read either one of them. So I'm going to be relying on those of you who have to. Um, any deletions, changes, or additions to the, either one of those minutes? Um, let's talk about them now. I'll start. <clears throat> Paragraph three, we're, we're, we're on the uh, January 6th minutes. Okay. Uh, review of zoning bylaws to be filed with town clerk for public hearing. Well, three lines the... down, you've got transit oriented um, district overlay. I think that ought to be transit. I'm sorry, you've got it as transit oriented overlay district. Yes. And I should, I think it should be reversed transit oriented district overlay. overlay. Okay. And, and that repeats itself somewhere else here. Well, yeah. Uh, third line on the, on the second, on the second page. Okay. Any, anyone else? Is that it, Harry? Yes. 
No other comments? Wow. Okay. Not on, not on that one. I do have on the other one. Let's um, let's just go to the next one and we'll vote on them. We'll you know approve them together. January 20 minutes. Comments. Tom, you said you had comments about these? Yeah, on the second page, um, the paragraph above public comment. Okay. In the middle of that paragraph, there's a sentence reading, there is an interest he believes toward the town selling the land that the Long Beach homes are on. That makes it appear that this might be the opinion of the committee. And that's certainly not what I meant to convey. I don't know exactly what I said, but I recommend just striking that sentence. Well, you said something, but you didn't say that. I didn't mean to say it in the way that it came out here. So <laughs> I think the best idea is just to strike it. Okay. All right. You, you see the one I'm saying right in the middle? It starts yeah. with the word there and ends with on. And it's uh, drawn a line through it. Thank you. All right, anybody else? Yes. Um, again, number three, discussion about conduct of public hearings and possible visual aids. The last line in that paragraph where you refer to building inspector Paul Orlando has no authority to initiate a criminal prosecution. I don't understand what the context is there. Yeah, I think that was um, in one of our previous versions of the um, you know, administration section 15 bylaw where we did have a criminal prosecution in there and it was to be initiated by the building inspector. And that was the context. It's kind of a, it's a moot point now because it's not, there are no more criminal prosecutions. So that's where- So how do we want to handle that, that sentence? Um, well, I mean- you want a little more clarification on that? I, I said that. So just he didn't have authority to do that, but it, it's kind of academic at this point. Yeah, the language has been deleted, Harry. The language is so that. I, I, I understand that. I'm just saying, do we delete that sentence in the minutes or do we expound on what you just explained? Well, he didn't expound in the meeting. Yeah, I talked about it more in the meeting, but yeah. I think it is it is correct. I did say that. Yeah. I might have said more, but that, you know, like I said, it's not, that that section was deleted from our section 15 so it is correct in other words i don't think it's wrong okay it looks out of place i just you know i the, the context is missing that's that's all i'm that's my comment i i, I agree but yeah. okay and then um next item member items number four the third line um denise is that the right Title Sustainable Housing Working Group? For now, yes. Okay, all right. That's all. Okay, great. Anybody else? Okay. Um, so, motion to approve the January 6, 2020, and January 20, 2000, I'm sorry, January 6, 2022 and January 20, 2022 minutes with uh, any change with changes as indicated. So move. I'll make that motion. Okay, to, uh, Tom, second. you first, Harry seconds. Uh, I'll do roll call vote, uh, Tom. Aye. Harry. Aye. Peter. Aye. Denise. Aye. Okay, minutes approved, five zero with minor corrections. Um, all right, so the next item is the um, a and application from Kevin and Sonia Mertz, Mers. It's the minutes, unfortunately, would say 69 Pigeon Hill Street. We talked to Mary about that. It's actually 68 and 64 are the two properties, but um, that's the way it came out. So. As you know, just to remind all of you with an ANR, 
Um, we've got 21 days from the date of filing to either approve or disapprove of the ANR. There are no, there are no conditional ANRs. So you can't say, well, we approve it, but we wanna add these conditions. It's either up or down. It has to be done within 21 days. If it's not done within 21 days, it's deemed approved by law. So our 21 days on this, based on when it was filed, um, expires before our next meeting. So this is it in terms of review and uh, a decision. So why, with that being said, uh, who is here from the Mertz representatives? Okay. Uh, good evening, uh, members of the planning board. Uh, my name is Chris Sparagis from the Engineering and Survey Office of Williams and Sparagis. Can everyone hear me okay? Yes. yes. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm here this evening with the uh, property owners of number 64 uh, Pigeon Hill Street, uh, Sonia and Kevin Mertz, and we're here to present an A&R plan uh, to the planning board uh, and the subject of that A&R plan is uh, 64 uh, Pigeon Hill Street. Uh, we're located um, north, north central uh, part of the town, just to the west of Pigeon Hill, towards the end of uh, Pigeon Hill Street. And with your permission, Mr. Chair, is it okay to share my screen? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yep. Kelsey's going to have to let you do that. Okay. Can everyone uh, see the plan on the screen? Yep. Okay, great. <clears throat> so um, we are in the uh, RA uh, zoning district, uh, which requires a minimum lot area of 12,000 square feet and 75 feet of frontage uh, with a 20 feet setback from the front lot line and 15 foot setback requirements from the side and rear property line. What we're doing on this plan, and I'm gonna zoom in a little bit here, this is the lot that we're talking about, and I've, uh, I've sort of color-coded it, but we're going to be creating uh, two building lots, what we're calling lot two, the pink lot that's going to uh, contain the existing home, the existing dwelling at 64, and another building lot here that we're calling lot three in this uh, aqua green color. We're also creating uh, lot 1A, uh, but it is not a building lot, and um, it is intended to be held in common ownership with lot one on this plan, which is uh, the property just over here to the west at number 68, Pigeon Hill Street. Each of the building lots that we're showing here uh, for lots two and three have more than 75 feet of frontage uh, on Pigeon Hill Street, which is a public way. And as you can see, if you were to walk around the existing home on our new lot two, um, we are providing a minimum setback of 15 feet uh, to the side uh, lot lines uh, that we have shown here. <clears throat> uh, clearly, uh, the house is set back more than 20 feet uh, from the street and more than uh, 15 feet from the rear lot line. Uh, this one's pretty straightforward, Mr. Chairman. I know you, know, you folks have a busy agenda. I'll, I'll um, end my formal presentation there, but I'm here to answer any questions that you folks may have. May I start? Yeah, go ahead, Harry. First question, Chris, is that dashed line that comes off of Pigeon Hill Street to the left of what is lot 1A? See the dashed line? Yes. What does that represent, if anything? <clears throat> sure. So um, uh, it, this, uh, this is on the, on the adjoining lot of yeah. number 68. Right. And it is an existing 20 foot wide utility easement. Okay. And it runs uh, from Pigeon Hill Street uh, to the rear lot line. All right. Oh. Um, my next question is, I have a general idea of that neighborhood. Um, can you tell us if there are any um, elevation changes from the street to the, to the existing home? Um, anything like that along these proposed, uh, along the two proposed lots? Absolutely, that's a, that's a, that's a good question. 
Um, there is a, if you'll notice, I'm gonna zoom in to the frontage here. Uh, and um, it's relatively uh, flat <clears throat> across the, um, the front portion of this property. There is, a sh there is a retaining wall that runs across a section of the property uh, here, but it's, uh, it's very short. It's just, it consists of one granite block. And it appears to me, you know, more, um, more decorative than um, retaining earth. Uh, but we have done a topographic survey across the property and um, uh, this, uh, this frontage that we're creating uh, can certainly be accessed uh, from Pigeon Hill Street. And uh, what about um, the lot uh, to, the, uh, to the right? To the east here? Yes. Uh, let's see what I can do, um, which might be a little bit easier. Uh, let me bring up, I'm gonna stop sharing just for a moment. And um, I don't usually do this for uh, for ANR presentations, but what I can do for you is I can pull up uh, the uh, plan <clears throat> that shows the topography of the land, Great. and I can answer your question better that way. Uh, so if you just bear with me just for a moment, I'll pull that information up on my screen. Thank you. Is that plan been filed with the planning board? Uh, no, it is not. It's just a, a topographic uh, plan. Um, that uh, that we prepared uh, on behalf of the property owners. Yeah, we usually don't uh, refer to plans that haven't been filed because then basically the only time anybody can see them is right now when you're presenting and not later. So the minutes will be reflecting the discussion about a plan that isn't part of the record. So um, I, I know it might help, but... Um, I don't think we can reference it at this point because it hasn't been filed with the board. Right. Uh, so um, I guess if you think about it, um, you can think about it as uh, just additional additional information. But I can I, I don't have to share the plan. I can just uh, tell you with words. How's that? That's better. OK, thank you. Um, so on the. Uh, on the other uh, across the other piece. Um, <clears throat> Mr. Korslund. Uh, there is um, there's a little bit of grade change uh, from the street. Uh, the, the street has uh, slopes slightly uphill as you come down Pigeon Hill Street from east to west across our frontage uh, from about elevation 150 to 156. So there's about a six foot grade difference from one side of the frontage to the other. And then across that um, lot two, excuse me, across that lot three that you asked about, the one that was uh, shown in green, from the frontage uh, across the front of the property, uh, it's slightly elevated uh, from the street frontage, but it's only, it's only about a two foot difference again, uh, very similar to the frontage of lot two. So it, it, it goes uphill, uh, but very gently. So my, I, my question is answered, um, but perhaps you might wanna just, further comment that from a standpoint of public safety and accessibility to those areas that you don't see any uh, particular um, obstruction to getting safety vehicles in there? Uh, no, no, not, not at all. Okay, thank you. Anybody else have any questions? I do, Jason, but I should point out to everyone that I will recuse myself from this vote because Sonia and Kevin are my neighbors. Um, but I did wanna ask a couple of questions. Um, one is, um, why are you cutting off that piece, the 3,500 square feet from lot two to add, what is that lot 1A? Why are you doing that, I guess, is my question. I'm just curious. So I know, I know Kevin, uh, Kevin, it looks like you guys are still muted. Um, the the Merses can probably answer that question better than I can. There you go. Uh, that's just to add additional land to our property. Just yeah, that, that's is that the answer, Mr. Mers? What do you mean? No, I mean is is there more We're adding additional land to our property with that? Upper. Okay, so, so lot 1A is land that currently is owned by, well, you own both lots, right? 
Yeah. Correct. Okay. So what you're doing is you're taking part of lot two. Let me back up a little so I understand it better. I'm sorry. There's your lot with your house it, right now, before you do anything, there's your lot with your house on it. And then there's another lot that adjoins your lot, right? I mean, that's it. They're just two lots right now. Correct. Yes. So what you're planning on doing for, you know, it's not no secret. It looks like you're trying to create a, a number of buildable lots here is um, you're creating lot three. You're, you're creating lot two and you're taking part of this larger lot, which is adjacent to yours, lot 1A. And, and this is a question I was gonna have is that it's gonna be essentially merged with your lot, right? Yes. That, right. That's correct, Mr. Chair. We have a note on the plan that says that lot 1A is not to be considered a separate building lot, but is to be held in common ownership with lot one to form one building lot total lot area, 24,565 square feet. That's in the bottom right-hand corner of the plan. And maybe this is a matter of semantics, uh, but why wouldn't lot 1A, if you're gonna make it part of your existing lot, why don't you simply merge that into your lot and then you'll have a new lot description that encompasses lot 1A instead of, keeping it under separate ownership. I don't really understand that. Why would you, why would there be a separate deed? Sounds like lot 1A is gonna be a separate deed with the MERS's name on it, but it's uh, essentially still a standalone lot, which is a little strange. Why that's, would- that's not, that's not the plan. The plan is to have it, have three lots at the end of this. Lot one and 1A would all be combined as one lot. Lot two would be a lot and lot three would be a lot. Yeah, but but your note doesn't say that though, does it? It it does it does say that, Mr. Chair. Okay, let um, me read it. It's not to be considered a separate building lot, but is to be held in common ownership with lot one to form one building lot. Okay, well, maybe it's just a matter of semantics then, because I might have said it's gonna be a lot one is gonna be merged with the existing law to be one, but I, that's kind of what you're saying, right? That, I mean, that's correct. And this is a, these are very typical notes that we, uh, that we show on an A&R plan. Uh, the subject of the plan is only 64, um, you know, 64 uh, Pigeon Hill Street. And there will be a, you know, there'll be a, a, a joining, a combining, a merging, however you want to refer to it. Uh, the most important thing to understand is that lot 1A is, is not to be considered a separate building lot. Yeah, I, I, I understand that. It was just a matter of, like I said, what, what's going to happen is that line that runs on lot, what is now lot 2, that dark line that goes up on the left-hand side of 1A, that's going to, that part of it, at least as far as lot 1A goes, is going to basically vanish. There's not going to be a line there anymore, right? That's gonna, correct. Okay. And we'll, we'll, all right. But there's no note that says that line goes away. This is just a note saying, I, I get what you're doing. Okay. Um, my other question has to do with, um, I don't have it in front of me, the plan, but Cliff's house. Does that plan show the, include the garage? Yes. Yes. Okay. So the, drawing as it is, because you specifically mentioned the separate wooden garage at your house, but there's no mention of the garage in the plan for Cliff's house. It's an attached garage, so it's all part of that one structure. That, that's what I just wanted to clarify. Yes. Okay. I'm, yep. I'm sorry, I'm lost here. You, you don't know which Cliff's one is Cliff's house? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, in okay. lot two, there's an yeah. attached garage. And I wasn't sure if it was included and the 15 foot setback was okay. including the garage or not. Gotcha. Yep, yeah, the garage is right over on this side. Okay, thank you. So I can't, I have to say, I can't help but notice that once you add that land to the 
lot one, it's 24,000 square feet or a little bit more than that, which makes it two building lots. Um, so I'll just point that out <laughs> potentially in the future. You mean lot, you're talking about what is now lot one when you add? Right. A, it becomes a bigger lot one can be subdivided. Yeah. Right. You got a utility, yeah. you got a utility easement there. Yeah. Where they, you know, you can't do anything in a utility easement. So. Oh, okay. You can't. No. Nope. No, that's prior room. So you're kind of stuck with that. Um, and yeah. it would count as part of the square footage when you divide. Yeah, it's just an easement the utility company has, which basically says it's, they have a right to cross it. They have a right to put lines there to maintain the lines, and you don't have a right to build anything in the easement or, or construct a driveway or anything like that. So okay, I wasn't aware. Although, although you could cut it in half the way lot three is cut in half to yep. get wider. Yeah, I mean, if you really wanted to, what like cut through the. If you really wanted to go crazy, you'd lose the garage. Yeah, I think we'll see this again. I'm just guessing. But look, this is, you know, this is the way of things, the way things are going, you know. What's the what's the width of uh, lot three at its narrowest? Uh, let's see. So lot three at its narrowest. I would uh, throw a, a measurement uh, tool on the plan here. It is a uh, 49.9 uh, feet, almost 50 okay. feet across. Lot three? Yeah. At the narrowest point. Yes, yeah, so let me show you. Uh, let me show you on the plan here. So the narrowest point um, is uh, from this point, mm -hmm. perpendicular to that lot line, yep. and that dimension is just shy of fifty feet. Yep. So any any house would probably have to go toward the back of the lot, right? Uh, not necessarily. Uh, you know, it's yeah. also it's possible to. Um, uh, to put the house, uh, a potential person could could fit a house out on the front portion. It all depends on the size of the house. Yeah, but you you think there's room for the setbacks in the front as well? Yes. And I know it's none of our business, but do you guys know if it's wet back there? I know on hillside there's a lot of, uh, you know, kind of mushy land. But I know this doesn't abut hillside. Just curious. So I, I believe, um, uh, and I and for, forgive me, um, uh, I'm filling in for someone tonight uh, for the professional answer surveyor. Um, I'm a professional engineer, and I, I did do my homework uh, and looking in the in uh, some regional maps and the information that we collected uh, during the preparation of this plan. I know that um, off the northeast corner uh, out here is a. It looks pretty suspicious, like a um, what are those called? A uh, um, pit. A motion. motion. Yes, thank you. Yeah, yeah. There's, a, there's a motion back there, and, and it's quite possible that it has a wetland associated with it. Okay, thanks. A motion is considered wetland, isn't it? I don't know. So uh, the definition of a wetland. This exercise, why are we talking about that? <laughs> I know. I said it was not of our business. I just was curious. <laughs> well, it looks <laughs> from the... Questions. From the topo plan that's on the town GIS, it pitches about six feet from the corner of the house back to that corner towards that towards that upper right hand corner from sort of the bubble towards the corner. The this is in the RA district. Yep, that, that's correct. So you're Minimum air uh, lot dimension is 12,000 square feet. Um, you know, obviously lot A doesn't, one A doesn't count, but lot two and lot three, and then the remaining, and then what's, what is the existing lot? Um, houses all fit within that. The frontage on the street is 75 feet. They just make it uh, those, Lot, um, 
one a is uh, just make lot two just makes it what would be lot two. I'm assuming that 75 feet on lot two. Uh, where does that start and where does it end on the line? There's a line that is. Um, so I've, I've highlighted here in, in color, um, but you can see as I zoom in here, this is the lot line and where it intersects with the uh, front lot line from that point here to uh, the intersection of this new lot line where it meets the frontage here between those two points at 75 feet. Okay, exactly, between those two. That's points. correct. When we prepare a, a plan like this, after we do our due diligence and perform a property line determination on the ground, you can see how we, we tie it, we physically located and, and found uh, record uh, drill holes and other property boundary markers. We come back and we mathematically prepare the plan. And then we uh, do a routine uh, called uh, lot reports for each of the lots. And the lot reports are a double check um, to make sure that um, the meets and the bounds that we have shown here that go all the way around each of the lots. We do an independent check of each of the lots to make sure that they add up uh, to the proper area. And that's, that's the way we also check the dimensions to make sure we didn't make a mistake while we were drawing the plan. You know, and, and that sounds very like a good practice. I'm, I'm looking at your highlighted map there, which is very helpful. I'm also looking at the large um, Mylar map. Let me just make sure that I'm Looking at this correctly. Yeah, you know, it's the same on the Mylar and the other maps. And this is where I'm a little concerned. It's because it is exactly 75 feet, and anything under that would be inadequate frontage. But there's a line that is along that that matches the 75 feet. I don't know if you have your your actual survey map there. Uh, are you referring to the mile to the mylar plan? Yeah, the mylar and the other ones. You know, the the ones that aren't mylar that were filed with our with this board. Yep, yep. So so this plan that uh, that I colored up is a photocopy of the, you know, of the of the plan that we submitted. You can see it here. Yeah, uh, look, looking at the line. It's, and the line that you're referring to, Mr. Chair, is that along the frontage or? Could you blow that up? Sure. Okay. Okay, here it is. You see, it says 75 feet. Yep. There's a line that goes beyond a 1A, goes beyond 1A in on the left hand side. And then it goes beyond uh, lot three on the right. So it makes me wonder where's that 75 feet? In other words, does it go from the corner of each lot or beyond? Because that line that that indicates I don't know what that indicates is 75. There's a line uh, that, sh that goes beyond the, the other lines on the map. So what is that line? It's very confusing. Yeah, that's okay. So that's a physical feature that's, you know, that we uh, were required to show. It's an existing retaining wall. Uh, I think I mentioned it when uh, we were talking about access across the front here. Yep. If I zoom in uh, and you can see that it, um, it roughly follows the front lot line, but we physically located this, this, uh, this structure, uh, a retaining wall, and it's, it's about one foot wide. And uh, we use a symbol with a, with a little carrot, you know, every so many feet to depict the physical location of the wall. And then it has a thickness to it. So that's the second line that you see that's inside the lot, if you will. Uh, but the dark line represents the frontage. Okay. Uh, and, uh, and these are the lot lines on either side. And where they intersect, um, there's a little dot. And uh, we use a dot uh, to help uh, the reader, you know, have, have their eye easily kind of focus in on where the lot intersection side, you see these little dots. Um, they're at all the intersection points. And that helps, helps the reader and the person who was looking at the plan understand where a dimension starts and ends. But this is a physical feature. It's a short retaining wall. You can see it here as well. I'm looking at the mylar here. Um, I see them. They're very small, but uh, they are there. And what you're saying is that that they 
there's the dark, the bold line that, that parallels Pigeon Hill, which is the actual property line, correct? That's correct. And that the line that's just to the lot side of the bold line, which, which kind of goes beyond the property lines, that's a physical feature indicating a physical feature. It's not a, it's not a boundary, is that correct? Not necessarily uh, the case. Uh, um, so uh, in this case, it, it, it doesn't, doesn't represent uh, the, the property boundary. Uh, but I'll give you an example of something that does. Um, on, on the east side of the property, do you see this symbol? Yeah. That's a fieldstone wall that absolutely represents the property line, in this case, uh, with the drill holes at the intersections. But I'm, I'm more focused on the line that's on lot two, the set, that parallel, that the seven. Sure, that's, that's, a, that's the retaining wall. I could, I could, print, I could bring up a, a street view if you'd like to see what it looks like. Uh, well, you know, I, I just I just want a clarification because there there are two lines, they're parallel, and I wanted to know what the inner line was represented. And what you're saying is that 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 represents a physical feature that's on the ground, uh, but in this particular line, not the one on the other side. In with this line that does not represent the boundary, the 75 feet. That's 75 feet is the bold line that's underneath. That's yeah. correct. That's correct. Between the dots. Got it, okay. But one thing that I, I can't believe I didn't notice before, the driveway, the existing driveway cuts across lot three. So you're gonna to have to relocate the driveway, right? Yes, that's correct. So when are you going to do that? Uh, that hasn't been determined yet, but um, but at some point, uh, you know, a new, uh, you know, another driveway will, will be cut through the the frontage of, um, of lot two. That's going to be a really tight turn to get in those garage doors. <laughs> Yeah, the, the, this is uh, this is where the garage uh, the garage is located here. Yeah. Uh, this is where the first uh, first bay is. Uh, you know, and so you can see the the direct access to the um, to the garage, uh, and the secondary one uh, will be used you know primarily for you know storage of other other equipment you know that you kind of wheel into the garage that sort of thing. But this is the primary uh, vehicular you know access one right here. You can see it's a straight shot from the street. Okay, uh, I'm I'm done with questions about this. It seems to conform to the requirements for an A and R. It's certainly in a public way. There's there's no question about that. It seems to be frontage on all of the proposed uh, the proposed lots, lots three, lot two, and what will be just what you know the existing lot, which is lot one A and the existing lot together. So. Um, any Chris, further? Maybe just just for the record, can we have Chris state that the dimensions, setbacks, whatnot, conform to uh, the town's ordinance for setback and uh, frontage and and depth and 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 back lot line. Uh, so I can tell you that uh, from our uh, from our plan preparation uh, that the uh, that the existing home that's uh, that's on that's going to be on lot two does meet all the setback requirements for side rear front setback and that each each of the lots that we're creating and identifying as building lots which include lot two and lot three have requisite frontage on a public way um, might remind the planning board that. By signing an AR plan, uh, you are not um, certifying um, that this, uh, you know, plan conforms to zoning or anything like that. It, that's, uh, you know, that's that's up to the building inspector and other folks. You can see that that's a, a standard. Um, probably notice that when you stand when you're signing an AR plan, it says endorsement by the planning board is not a determination as to conformance with zoning. So you're not responsible for you know making that determination. But I can tell you that um, 
this is what we do for a living. We'll be doing yeah. it for over 30 years. And, and uh, we, we check these things very carefully for our clients before we you know, present a plan to, to a board like yours. Yeah, no, no, Chris, this was more about form than substance. I'm, I'm satisfied. Okay. Uh, okay, well, that being said, um, we have a motion to approve the A&R plan. Um, um, no moved. Wait, wait a second. second. Yeah, let me just, uh, one thing, it says 64 Pigeon Hill Street, uh, motion to approve, mo seconded. Uh, I'll take a roll call vote. Obviously, Denise, you're not voting, so. Um, I abstain. Abstain, so Tom. Aye. Uh, this is uh, Peter. Aye. Harry. Aye. And I also vote in favor. Uh, the ANR is approved and uh, we just need to get everybody down to now we're on Zoom. We're not having meetings in person at this point. So everyone's got to get down here to sign these various plans in the Mylar, which will be done probably next week. I'm just guessing. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Thank you very much, everyone. I appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Okay. Commend him as an excellent pretzel maker. What? what? He was an excellent pretzel maker, the way he curved all that stuff in. Oh, yeah. <laughs> all right. So the next item on the agenda is um, the special permit um, application from Brian Bagenstos for 162 Thatcher Road. Um, I think everybody, um, I know I know four of you, including me, were at the site, although we didn't discuss anything, but we happened to be there at the same time on Sunday. We've all seen the site. And um, I guess, Harry, you came there at a different time. So we've been there, we've looked at it. Yeah, I got my own private tour. Yeah. <laughs> um, is anybody here on behalf of the owners? Got two, Julie and Hayes Engineering. Hi, good evening. Uh, yes, I'm here from Olson Lewis Architects and um, we also have Peter Ogren from Hayes Engineering. Hello. Hey. So, it's, uh, you know, it's quite a unique site. Um, in terms of its location, it's quite a unique house in terms of its configuration. And, you know, we could see what you're doing by the foundation, that area that's been excavated. Um, I have, um, I guess there's some discussion about lighting, Tom, is that? Well, we want to certainly make sure that any any new lights conform with the uh, the general bylaw for new new fixtures. And speaking there on Sunday, we understood that the uh, owner was willing to take the existing lighting and make them conform as well. Is that, is that accurate? I have to say I haven't reviewed that piece with him. Um, I'd be interested in the requirements of the board prior to him making that decision. I think um, the ones, and I, I, I would be really interested in what your all opinions are. I didn't get professional lighting um, company opinions or engineers, but my from what I can see based on your documentation, the the lanterns are the non-conforming pieces um the two there's two lanterns that are on piers as you enter the site and then there's two um at the top of the hill at the approach side of the house um so the kind of the back away from the water um there's also some small lanterns on the house and those in all of those you can actually see you know, through the glass, you can see the little bulbs beyond. Um, 
but it seems to me that those are the ones that are a question, but I, but I would look to you now that you've all, all been there and, and to hear what your thoughts are. Um, it, it feels like, anyway, I'd, I'd like to hear if it was a requirement prior to, you know, the client saying he'll do it. Well, as, as I understand it, the lanterns, the kind of big green post lamps that are along the drive um, are, aren't the issue, are they, Tom? I mean, they seem to be- They seem to be shielded and facing down. Yeah, what? yeah. the poles. Yes. Yeah, they seem to be fine. I don't- mm -hmm. I think we're speaking of different things. When you say the lanterns, yeah. the ones mounted on the granite- Yes. Right, squares, yes. Those and there's, there's four of those. those. So those are different than um, Mr. Shaw than the pole lights that you're describing. Yeah, because I agree, those do seem to be conforming with your requirements, your bylaw. So there's actually two requirements. One is fully shielded, and you've, you've spoken to that. The other requirement is the correlated color temperature. That is the color of the light. And the bylaw says no higher than 2750 Kelvin. And we can't tell by just looking at a fixture, especially in daylight, what its CCT is. So the owner is willing to have his electrician review all those and, and bring those in in conformance. That would be perfect. Is that a requirement? If you want to be strict about what's in the general bylaw, there are separate requirements for existing fixtures and for new fixtures. So it is a requirement on new fixtures. And there's a partial enforcement of that on existing features. Um, I, I do have the bylaw close, close at hand, but if you could review that piece of it regarding existing, I'd be interested in that. I'm not gonna paraphrase it. I just go by the language. Um, of the so I, what I read is that, um, actually I had it right in front of me. I actually gave a copy to the owner on Sunday. Sure, and he, he has it from us too. Um, existing, which are not in compliance with the subsection C, which is what you described. Um, they have to, they can, they have alternative requirements that can be met. One is they can be turned off between the hours of 11 and five. And again, this is if they're not in compliance. We don't know yet about the pole fixtures um, or they only operate for five minutes maximum and when triggered by motion detector is, is how I read it under compliance regarding existing. So I think, oh, go ahead. I, I'd just like to speak. Isn't it appropriate to discuss this and see whether there's any neighborhood objection to any of them? I mean, the lanterns that are up by the house, I think, are so far away from the lot line that they couldn't affect anybody but the owners. And I also think that there's not a lot of houses nearby at the frontage. So wouldn't it be appropriate to set the hearing date and and find out if there's any any issues as far as the neighbors are concerned with the light as a nuisance? I think the reason we're bringing it up is in other cases uh, where we brought this up, um, the owners have voluntarily made the change. So I guess we were hoping that that might be the case here. Also, I should add that the uh, interference with neighbors is not the only issue. This is actually to be enforced by the building inspector. And the other goal is uh, dark sky. So even if you're out in the middle of nowhere and you got a light shining directly upward, that's a dark sky problem. Yeah, I think uh, let, let's do this. I mean, it sounds like um, this is something that we can conclude on. There are obviously different requirements for existing. These are existing. They sound like they're pretty, I mean, those even non-compliant lights could be met by just motion sensors or something like that. Um, but assuming they're compliant, then we don't need to worry about that. We still have to have a public hearing. So is there anything, any information you folks want? I mean, the, the bylaws, the bylaw for lighting is what it is. We're not, you know, it, we're not adding or subtracting from that. 
So the question, I think, to the point of disturbing neighbors, sure, that is, that is something. It's a bit of something that you would want to look at. But as I think, as Tom said, um, the other criteria would be the, um, you know, dark skies. Not even if it's not disturbing neighbors, and there don't seem to be any immediate neighbors around this property. It is a high property, and um, there could be light emanating that does affect the uh, general night sky. So that's that's another criterion that we have to look at. So I don't, I mean, this doesn't sound like any big deal. I think uh, you guys, sounds like you need to talk about this with your client. I don't think you've had that conversation from what I'm hearing. We have to a limited degree. Uh, and I, I guess I would just say again, that part of my point is I, I want my client to have a clear understanding of what's required versus what they're offering to do. Um, so you've spoken about another project where the clients, the homeowner, was happy to change everything out to make it completely conforming. I don't, I don't think that that mandates future projects and, and development. So I, I, I'd like to instead give them direction on what's required, uh, which we're, we want to do, and then they can decide, do they want to go above and beyond that or not? Um, but I, I think that I keep looking at the bylaw itself and it doesn't, it doesn't say specifically to change out every non-compliant fixture. Well, you know what, uh, you're, the, that's true. It doesn't necessarily say that, Julie, but this is in, and this is an important point, that the lighting bylaws are in the general bylaws. They're not in the zoning bylaws because if they were in the zoning bylaws, you, I think you would be, you can't, zoning can't regulate a pre-existing feature. But the general bylaws are basically applicable to all lighting, whether it's existing or not, non-existing and is to be constructed. So yeah, as your question, you can walk, drive around Rockport and you can see um, lighting that doesn't comply with the general bylaws. That is true, you can, um, but that doesn't mean it's right or following the law, it's just, that's an issue. Enforcement. And he, in this case, you are asking the planning board for uh, a special permit to construct an addition on an existing home with some of the lighting that apparently does comply and some of it which may or may not. So I think your job between now and our public hearing is to find out <clears throat> where, I mean, where this lighting oh, stands. We're kind of everyone's operating, no pun intended here, but everyone's operating in the dark because we don't know. We haven't seen it. So we haven't seen it on at night. So we don't know. So wouldn't that be something you'd want to do? Absolutely. And I and I can get information on the color of the lamps prior to next meeting, the public hearing. But I that isn't my question, maybe it's at the public hearing where you decide, is that part of your, you know, is, is that a, you know, something that needs to happen in order for you to approve it? And maybe that's what you determine at the public hearing. But I guess I wanted to hear from the board, if you're saying, if you're saying that you're going to require this, I wanted clarification on that. Are you requiring it or not? I'll give you an example, okay? We have some, let's say, forget this other property owner because they, they did it voluntarily and it wasn't even an issue. But let's say we have a property with giant spotlights outside that are blaring, you know, all over the neighborhood. And they come in and they want, and they need site plan review for something. Don't, I would, that we would have the authority to say, look, you've got these giant spotlights. They're not compliant. You're now coming in, you want site plan approval for another feature on the property, let's bring what's existing into compliance while we're, you know, while you're asking us for permission to, um, you know, build something else. Wouldn't, I mean, that doesn't. Okay. So you're, thank you. You're answering, you're answering my question. So thank you. And, and maybe it's and, not. And it, but it's true when you're making, you know, when you're determining if you're going to give an approval, you have the opportunity to ask 
whatever you like to a certain degree. Well, yeah, I, I don't think- Oh, that's- it's, I don't think it's an unreasonable request. Um, do you? Well, again, we're, we're gonna get a little bit more information about the pull fixtures. Um, if we were needing to change those out entirely, that would be a big item. Um, so I think we'll, we'll have more information as to how big of a request that is. Okay. And, okay. And, and that'll include you know decisions that the clients made as to what we know we're going to do. Yeah, I, I think you want to pipe in, if I may, from, uh, you know, from my perspective, and I, I'm only speaking for me, I'm not speaking for the entire board, the more information that we have on an application that allows us to make a decision, the more efficient this process becomes. And so from the standpoint of specifications on the fixtures that are being, or, uh, that are, are used and will be proposed to be used, I think that brings us to a conclusion much quicker. Yeah, and most applicants have provided us with that information uh, in, with, with a fair amount of specificity, uh, and it works out fine. I think. Well, for our new our new fixtures, it's going to be two cans, recessed cans that are in the soffit that will aim down. Finding the specifications for a, a pole fixture that exists, I'm not even sure how I'm going to do that. I was, you know. I looked at everything I could, um, barring we can, we can do our best. We'll get the, the GC up on a ladder and climb up there and see, you know, we'll be able to figure it out. Okay, good. So let's, look, can, anyway, thank you. Hey, um, we usually need more than two weeks cause you've got to do the notice, you know, we have to right. You have to notice the adjoiners and there's a whole process which we can we can are we can certainly help you guide you through that if you have any questions about it um it happens with every special permit but we're looking at our next meeting would be uh i'm looking into april would be the 7th of april so we have one two um, three, we actually have three weeks for our, our next meeting. So that you would probably have enough time to get your notices out. Um, you have the public hearing on the 7th. If not on the 7th, then it would have to be on the 21st. So, I mean, one more point. I'm sorry, one more point. Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, just one more point because the statement was made earlier about um, a butters down, um, down near the road. As I exited, I did notice that there are a butters to the north who would be affected potentially by that light fixture that is at the gate. So- um, Every single time I log in. There's some background noise with someone. Yeah. Well, look, let's let's go back to this. Just getting a date Would the 7th of April be acceptable to you folks, or do you want to push it off to the 21st? Because if you, if we do everything for the 7th, if we say find the 7th and things don't go, your notices don't get out on time, then, you know, then you've done it all for nothing and you got to start all over again, which you really don't want to do. So it's, it's, it's a two week difference, really. Julie, yes. Are you muted? Yes, she is. Oh, okay. oh. Thank you. Uh, I, it, that date works for me, but I just wanted to check with um, Mr. O'Gran at Hayes to see if we, we should instead look at that later date in April. Because did you have a conflict, Peter? For he's muted, also. <laughs> Maybe you can unmute him. Okay. Yeah, the seventh is fine as far as I'm concerned. Okay. Okay. It's just 
as I said, getting the notices out with sufficient time for the abutters to receive them before the public hearing. I don't know how many abutters you have. I imagine there are quite a few, just guessing. Um, so if it were me, <laughs> I would put it off, but that's up to you. Unless you're in a hurry. If you're in a hurry, we'll do it on the seventh. Yeah, let's, if we can keep it at the seventh, that would be great. We'd really appreciate it. So, um, all right. So do we have a motion to schedule the public hearing for the I moved. Permit uh, review at 162 Thatcher Road for April 7th of 2022. Did I hear a motion already? Harry made the motion. We made the motion, seconded. Second. Seconded by Denise. Roll call vote. Harry. Aye. Denise. Aye. Um, Aye. Uh, Peter. Aye. I'll vote in favor too. So, uh, Julie, uh, you, know, you should talk with um, Mary tomorrow. Just and and also read your read the bylaw uh, about what the notice requirements because you should, you want to make sure you got that all right. Right, absolutely. Thank Jason, you. Jason, in the introduction, you mentioned the excavation as if all of the work is done there, but I understand that there's also to be a new dormer at the other end of the building. Uh, yeah, that's that's in the drawings that were submitted. It's already in the drawings? Yeah. Did we read those drawings correctly? Uh, there is a dormer that's part of the proposed project, yes. At, at the other end of the building? Yes. Okay. So that's a little extra motivation to include more of the lighting because you're modifying both ends of the building. Got it. There's also a couple of spotlights on one of the balconies that- Yeah, I noticed that there's a couple of lights. They look like spots uh, on the second floor. Um, Again, not knowing what they, they, they were on shield and yeah. So but easy to get to. Okay, next uh, we're done with that. You got your special hearing scheduled. So thank you. Thank you. See you next month. Okay. Good. So um, special town meeting discussion. That's the next item. That only the only point there is May May sixteenth is our special town meeting. That's that's been just decided at this point. So that's mark your calendars. I'm I don't know exactly the time, but I'm assuming it's going to be in the evening because it's a Monday. Um, joint meeting with the CBA. We had that yesterday. Everyone was there. Everyone knew what happened. Um, and um, <laughs> we have some things we need to talk about. And I don't, this really isn't the time to do that because we don't really have a, it's not really an agenda item. And it, we need, so we need to have another, we need to do this at another meeting. But I, it seems as though we should. We shouldn't wait to the seventh because that's we're going to be now really up against our warrant deadline, and um, I I would like to suggest of having a special meeting next week um, simply to discuss the what was brought up by the zoning board of appeals, what we discussed, and we can discuss what uh, changes to the bylaws we can make uh, without a public hearing. And then, you know, which ones would require a public hearing, if any, and then, you know, what we want to do. I mean, there are, whole, there are a whole host of issues that are involved with that, but we do need to discuss it among ourselves. I, and I'm, is Amy Quistle on this call? Or is that just a, is that some other Amy? I think that's another Amy. Must be another yeah. Amy. Amy K. Okay, so it's not her. So, and, and you know, to get some advice of counsel on that, some definitive advice about 
okay, you can change this, this, or this without having a public hearing, but you can't change this in this way without having a public hearing. I mean, that's what I'm looking for. I don't know about other people, but I, I didn't feel that the meeting we had um, get last night with all the people involved and all the talking that we really was a good time to get the answers in a to those questions in kind of a definitive way. So I'm hoping to do that uh, at this special public meeting that we're that I'm talking about. Not public meeting, special public special hearing or meeting. It's not a public hearing, special meeting. So do you know if Amy's available next week? To join I, don't, us? I don't know um, if she is, Denise. I, I, I have a call to her. I'm hopefully going to get an answer to that. Uh, okay. I, as you know, I did write her um, before this joint meeting posing this question. So, mm -hmm. and she did answer some things at the meeting last night. I thought she said, I thought she said that if it was simply a change in the special permit authority, that it did not require a new public hearing to change that, that we could just make the changes um, and then be done with it. But then there was a um, some more discussion about the coastal uh, regulation, coastal bylaws. And then there was something there about, yeah, you probably would need a public hearing under certain circumstances. So that's what I remember. Right. Um, so any anybody have a, I'm looking at my calendar. I unfortunately have a long planned two week vacation starting this weekend. Oh, nice. Yeah. Good for you, Peter. Where are you going? Uh, Beckway. Where? Beckway in the Grenadines. Nice. Caribbean. They have the internet, you know. I mean, just yeah. get on this. <laughs> Same time zone. I thought Beckley was a college. <laughs> this is, we were there when the virus started and had to come home because the planes were starting to stop flying and they were starting to close the country for the first couple of weeks. It must have been joyful. <laughs> yeah, well, look, stressful. you're welcome to be part of this um, if you want, which I don't, doesn't sound like you want to. <laughs> well, no, you know, I forgot it's Zoom. <laughs> it follows you anywhere, just like your emails and your texts and all that. Yeah. Um, all right, we're looking at the week of the 21st. Um, let's see what we got here. Um, I'm okay with either the 23rd or the 24th, which are Wednesday and um, Thursday. We could do it at 6.30 like our regular meetings. Yeah, that works for me. Either is better for me. Yeah, either works for me. Okay, which, which one, Tom? 23rd, Wednesday is better for me, but I could do Thursday if need be. Well, I don't think we need to. We have time. You know, we only need 48 hours to post a... Um, special meeting so I'll, I'll see mary tomorrow and just tell her post it and we'll let we'll let the zba know we're having a special meeting not a joint meeting but a special meeting to discuss these things and we'll decide you know what we do. So, but what if what if we can't get amy i guess is my question well i i think i'll be able to reach her uh okay before and give you know kind of down on what we're talking about because really it sounds to me like we're talking about well in addition to the bulkhead definition which didn't appear in the body um, it seemed that every other change with the exception of one involved the um who was the special permit authority right there were no there were no other requests or right demands, I should say. And the um, coastal zone. And the coastal zone was the only other one that is um, was beyond that. But those, that was it. So I think she could give us an answer pretty. pretty okay. Okay. So, okay. 
So the 23rd, 30. So is that tentative at this point in time, subject to um, Amy getting back to us? No, I mean, that's, okay. uh, she'll get back. We'll get her before. All right, all right. Well, you have to uh, get the Zoom host available as well. Right. Yeah. That's not always the case, I have found. No, okay, right, but I'll, I'll um, yeah. Is, um, is Conservation Commission next Wednesday or the following Wednesday? I don't know. Kelsey, do you have, do you know uh, what's going on with Zoom hosting next week? I know next Wednesday is Conservation, the 23rd. Well, what about the 24th? Do you know if there's anything else? Um, let me see. I may be able to check. There, there, there's more than one Zoom host if you need to. Uh, yeah. Well, I know, but I'm going to check to see if, if there's anything on. Um, I, I like to watch the Conservation Commission meetings. They're entertaining. Entertaining? <laughs> You'd like to stay up until 11 o'clock? I didn't say I watched the whole meeting. Right. You know, uh, the end. You haven't seen the whole thing. Yeah, I, I haven't been assigned for all of them for next week yet, so I don't know. Okay, yet. but you you haven't been assigned for the twenty fourth at this um, point. Not yet. Okay, good. Well, let's do it on the twenty fourth, <laughs> just because we know there's at least one um, host who might be available, and we know that that there's gonna be a conservation commission meeting on Wednesday. And we know Harry really doesn't wanna miss it, so. That's okay. accurate. So Thursday, the 24th at 6.30, um, special meeting of the planning board to discuss uh, changes discussed at the joint meeting. Um, any more to schedule that special meeting? So moved. moved. Oops. I'll second. Okay. Denise moved. Harry seconds. Roll call vote. You can vote, Peter, even though you may not be. So. Uh, uh, Denise. Aye. Um, Aye. Harry. Aye. Uh, and I'll vote in favor. So let's make it the 24th at 6.30. Kelsey. Could you just pencil it in on your calendar just in case, you know, just so we sure. know Heads somebody up. there to host, okay? That'll take that'll take care of one problem. All right. I'll I'll let the zoning board of appeals solve it so they can so they can maybe you know appear. I don't know. We'll see. Um, well, two of them listened in tonight. <laughs> oh, good. Well, that's good. Yes, yeah, Peter. Was that Peter? Peter and Britta. Oh, good. Okay. Well, then that's great. Um, all right. Next item is the draft letter rehousing choice. Um, yeah. Before I, 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 before we talk about that, I just want to tell you I did participate as a representative of the town of Rockport in a, um, I don't know how to, what you would call it, a, a session with um, the um, MBTA community with the Department of Housing and Community Development, uh, DHCD, and it was being hosted by Chris Clutchman, who's kind of in charge of this MBTA community guideline stuff now. Um, the In addition to me being there, there were a bunch of other uh, communities, although not as many as I thought. One of them was uh, was the mayor of Gloucester. He was there and he, you know, kind of said his tale of woe with what's happening there. I don't know if anybody's following it, but there's a real movement uh -huh. in Gloucester kind of anti-movement mm -hmm. uh, that's kind of taken on a life of its own. But she said at the beginning of the meeting, look, if you have individual comments, don't, this isn't the time to bring them up. And I, I honored that, I didn't, but I did mention, but two things were discussed. 
Number one, I think it came out, it came out pretty clearly both from her and other people who were associated with her with the uh, DHCD that there has been a, quite a bit of concern about this one size fits all um, you know, MBTA community, which is the acres, the 25 acres, and you know, just I, I think it's not going over well, especially, and they recognize with the smaller communities, it's not going over well. And um, one thing I, the other thing I learned was that, which I, I wasn't clear about from the regulations, but this is the way they're looking at it is, you have to have at least 25 contiguous acres um, and that your other 25 acres, at least according to them, and I haven't read the guidelines again, can be, don't have to be in 20, don't, it doesn't have to be another 25 acre uh, area. It can be something less. In other words, you can break it up into 10, 10 and five or something like that, but it has to be a total of 50. That's the way I understand it too, uh, Jason. And I think the minimum size is five acres. Yeah, five is the minimum, but it's got to be yeah. one that's 25. Well, I just want to, I want to do a little quick screen share. Can you uh, turn that on, Kels? It just, it's disabled right now. You should be able to right now. Okay, there we go, yeah. Now, the question is, can I use it? <laughs> I had a problem last time, let's see. We see your screen. Oh, good, okay. Great. You see the green plant? Not yet. Oh, here we go. Here's the plant. Here we go. It's up. See that? Oh, gone, now it's gone. See the, my other screen now? No, we're oh. looking at your Zoom uh, window. Oh. It well, was there a minute ago. Okay, well, let me bring it back then. I moved it to a, a different screen, but um, I'll keep it on this one. Got it now? Uh, yeah, there it is. Right now. See it? Yep. Yep. Okay. That's that's the 25 acre radius. So that's down from the 50. And I have the 50. I can show anybody the 50 if they want to see that. So that's 25, which is better, yeah. but it still creates some issues. And the other question I have is where are we going to put the other, where <laughs> we put the other 25, you know? How would we break that up? So, so I have a question, Jason. Yeah. Actually, a comment. As I recall, you do you don't have to be within that half a mile distance from the MBTA station. You can put those in other locations within the town. Yeah, I don't I don't remember that, Harry. Uh, I don't either. Yeah. Uh, in oh, fact, the if you drew the half mile circle. The 25 doesn't have to be in the middle either. No, it doesn't have it to be, be. Any, anywhere in that half mile circle. Right. I mean, for us, for us, it makes sense for the 25 to be where it is. I mean, unless somebody has any better ideas. Yeah. Um, let me the just. Half mile circle gets all the way to Beach Street, I think. Yeah, let me show you the. Um, you want to see the half mile? There's the half mile. Yeah. 15. Oh, sorry. It's half mile is basically the entire downtown. It's everything. Yeah. Yeah. And then okay. uh, we have we have the 50 acres, which is here. Okay. I think that five half mile is like 500 acres. The yeah, 50 acres is 10% of the half mile radius. It's, it's all the way. It goes all the way to the water. So yeah, so this little purple circle could be anywhere in those 500 acres. Yeah. So I, I, um, I, I done a draft letter. This letter has to be in there in the uh, DHCD's hands by the end of the month. So 
you know, I, since I've done it, there are a couple of changes that I wanted to make. The, one of the main ones is that the uh, Board of Realtors, uh, this was in, actually in Boston Magazine, the Board of Realtors has a list of uh, median home prices in all of the communities in the Boston area and the surrounding area, including Rockport. Rockport's median home price for 2021 is now $808,500. <laughs> and it was last, in 2020, it was $665,000. So it's gone up really- oh, 30%. Big, a big percentage. And I'm gonna change that in the letter because the numbers I have there are really outdated. Jason, I'll offer to get you some more current data from banker and tradesman on the median price for whatever region you want, county, town. Yeah, well, it was just a rock port. It, this is only, I appreciate that, Harry, thank you. But this was only to give, I mean, I think this information was reliable because yep. of the source. Uh, and it was for 2021. I just wanted to impress upon the, you know, the um, DHCD that we've got, you know, we've got a really expensive housing market here and with um, very few options for housing, affordable housing in, you know, apartments or anything. So that was the only thing I, I thought of, but now, now with this other, little wrinkle, um, it seems to me that our, our concern is still the same that we've got, you know, a um, really limited area where we could rezone. Um, and I don't know if anybody's read the draft letter that I wrote. Um, I haven't gotten any comments. So I, I, assume I thought you sent it. Yeah, I read it, Jason. Um, I think the other thing, and not that they'll care about this, but I think, you know, people can understand the logic of placing the area around the train station into this district. But if we try to do that in any other part of town, I think the resistance is really going to be tough. Oh, yeah. I, I mean, first of all, it kind of defeats the purpose. Right. Putting it. <laughs> You know, like up in uh, Andrews Point or something, you know, what? Yeah. yeah. Do that or the South End or anywhere. I mean, it, the purpose is to make the public transportation accessible to people so they don't have to drive their cars everywhere. Right. If you start moving this area into other spots, we've got, you know, real problems. And yeah, let, let's talk about putting this. Um, multifamily housing in a RAA district as an overlay. I mean, it would be political, it would be suicide. You know, it would, it would never- It just wouldn't pass. And plus we have the, you know, water sewer issues too, but it wouldn't pass, so. Well, the guidelines give us five years, right? I mean, we're making certainly a valid attempt to get started on a 20% well, yeah, of what I, what I gathered from, from what I heard today is, they're going to back off this, I, this requirement. I'm just, that's my hunch. They're going to realize, wait a second, this just doesn't work. They're going to back off it. And, um, you know, I, I have to show you because I've showed other boards, but just to, um, because this is, this is pretty amazing. Um, we're supposed to have four, 540 units of multifamily housing, right? In the town, according to the, re where they're- that's, that, that's based on a 10% of your housing stock 15, number? 15, 15. I thought they said a 750 minimum. No, no, that's, that's if the 50 acres was, if that oh. was built out, but if that, but this is there, there's another thing that they, they talk about, which is the, um, forget the terminology that was used. Uh, I, I have in the letter. Um, the, yeah, minimum multifamily unit capacity. That's, that's their language. And it, they figure that you figure that out by taking 
15% in this case, because we are, we are by a train station and multiplying that times the total number of housing units in Rockport, which is 3,600. So that gets us to 540 units. This is a picture of the halyard, which everyone- across the crossing, yeah. Yeah. You know how many units are there? 200. 200, yeah, you know already, okay. Yeah, 200 units um, in- uh, And this is twice as tall as we allow. Yeah, six, well, it's yeah. one, three, four stories. It's six on 6.23 acres, that's 200. So can you, can you imagine? Two and a, you know, 200 more of those, those plus 200 more, plus another 140 more in the town of Rockport. I mean, it's like- Well, we don't have the infrastructure to support that. Well, we couldn't support it with the infrastructure yet, number one. And number two, like that would drastically change the, the face character. of our town. Yeah. And yeah. even if you find out where to put it, um, you know, you, you take, you take these buildings and say, okay, well, we're only going to have, you know, two stories or whatever you lop off two stories. Now you got to put them on the ground somewhere. Now yeah. you got, you know, now you got 12 acres or whatever it is where this has to go. It just, and that's just 200 units. It, it yeah. makes no sense. So anyway, look, I don't want to belabor this. If, um, unless if someone has any, um, anything they want to say about the letter, you can send it to me by email, but I, I'd like to get this out, you know, obviously before the deadline. So I, I plan to send it next week. If you have any comments or thoughts, just send it to me. I'll, you know, I'll try to incorporate it and uh, send out the letter with the attachments so they can see, you know, our, our geographic constraints because we do have significant constraints. Um, Okay, that's all I have on that. Any member items? I have, uh, I have one. I attended the CPC hearing on Tuesday and um, three proposals were presented. One for the Baptist church steeple and windows one for the preschool playground fence and one for the freight house and crane study, which, which are located at the train station. Um, so we still have one more set of proposals to review in April. Is that, uh, Denise, the one at the end of the, the you know, end of the station that's been, that looks like it needs help? Yeah, yeah. And unfortunately it's owned by the MBTA. Oh, so it's difficult to get anything. Um, yeah. yeah, right. Yep. No, so they want to have they want to have both designated in the National Historic Register um, and put a plaque up and. Um, well, you know, the question is, what will happen first? Will it fall down first? <laughs> will designation happen first. Is well, they want yeah, they want to work with the MBTA to try to stabilize the, the freight house. The crane is owned by the town. Wait, um, the crane is itself. Oh, is, the crane, the crane, yeah. Yes. So they want to put a plaque up at the crane and kind of, you know, put a little bit of the history there and um, try to stabilize, put maybe a more attractive fence around it and try to stabilize the freight house work with the MBTA to try to get that done so it doesn't deteriorate anymore. Yeah. Well, good luck. Yep. <laughs> well, yeah, no one's made any decision yet. We've got no. no, we don't vote, I think, until June about what we're going to recommend at town meeting in the fall. Any, uh, any other comments? I'm sorry, any other public Member items, we're on still. We haven't gone to public comments yet. Any other member items? I have one. If I can get my cat out of the way here. I noticed. <laughs> <laughs> I was trying to get voluntary compliance. I may need to have some enforcement here. Yeah, I think so. Uh, the Long Beach Option Committee will present its final report to the town this Saturday at 11 a.m. on Zoom. Nice. 
the final report is on the town website. I think it's on oh, the town okay. meeting tab. Great. Okay, good. Good, good reading. <clears throat> 50 something pages, I think. Oh. What's your Reader's Digest version of the conclusion? Uh, we, we did all the options that we thought were reasonable. And uh, I guess we ended up con concurring with the selectman that the, the uh, back to nature immediately doesn't doesn't make sense. It's just too big a financial hit. But we've been told we're not making a decision and we're not really making a strong recommendation, but uh, I have a personal opinion. I don't know if I'm allowed to uh, speak too broadly, but uh, we put a lot of attention into the managed retreat and I think it has some strong advantages. Okay, well, that'll be interesting. Um, if there aren't any more public comments uh, or any or more member items, uh, let's go to public comments. Anybody with their hand up, Kelsey? I do have Toby. Okay. You're unmuted, Toby. Thank you. Uh, Toby Arsenian, 95 Granite Street. Um, for, the, uh, for the presentation, uh, this to Tom um, on Saturday, uh, the DPW had uh, in their files the most marvelous photograph going back, I believe, to the 1950s of the seawall entirely disappeared. Could you dig that out of the files and produce it at that meeting? That would be you know, as telling as any of the photographs in the report, if that's possible. Uh, more generally to the planning board, your difficulties with uh, uh, Janine McDonald, if I've got her name correct, at 162 Thatcher Road. Um, that your, your present encounter with them on the site plan review is not the first appearance before the planning board. There was a site plan review for that property when it was built, long before any of you were on the board. And it would certainly help you uh, if you went back over that because the, all of the, the contention about the lighting, whether it has to comply with the rules now or whether it is in a manner of speaking grandfathered because these are existing fixtures, uh, would all of that, the legitimacy of that as a contention for the, uh, the offensive lighting uh, would depend on what was approved and what was not approved in the initial site plan review. Is that helpful? It is helpful. Um... Thank you, Toby. And uh, I think it was what, 2012 or something? Was that? My, my, my memory for dates is hopeless, but, but uh, if you could find out who was on the planning board at that time and failing that, you know, dig out the files. Uh, I, they went at that point, they were very much concerned about lighting. Uh, yeah. And, and, you know, it would not have been passed over. And they were also very much concerned about drainage in, in the construction of that, that long driveway. And you seem to have gone light on that. I don't know anything about it. It may be just fine or not. Well, I mean, what built is there. Um, I did speak with uh, H Hank Betts, who was, uh, I think he was on the planning board at that time. And I did mention this to him, and he was, I mean, this is his opinion, uh, but he did say that he thought that we should include, as part of our review, the existing lighting to make sure it was dark skies compliant. So that was his opinion. Uh, I think that you know, would be a good pointer. There's another uh, thing. We're all paying the building inspector, and he's responsible for the enforcement of the lighting bylaw in the code of bylaws. And as a matter of uh, practice and pra how things in fact work, as opposed to in theory, uh, the bylaw is not enforced at all unless somebody files a complaint. So if you feel strongly about the lighting, you could be the people to file a complaint and see that, that it's enforced. Uh, I have uh, you know, complaints of my own about projects uh, the lighting that uh, you signed off on, I don't wish to voice them in public, but I'll get them to you by uh, a roundabout fashion. Uh, one other thing, uh, the approval of the Mears' lots. I'm not objecting to it. I just don't understand, and I would like to understand. The third lot with the nine feet frontage, I thought you had to have 75 feet. I'm not objecting. I just wish to understand. 
It does yeah, have 75 feet, Troby. No, no, she's talking about 1A. One it's one nine a. feet. Well, he's talking about yeah. nine. Oh. And that's not a buildable lot, so they were clear on that. So does it... Does this mean that you can create a lot without the 75 feet if you put on it that it's not a buildable lot? Well, it's it's part of the, it's going to, this is one of the things we were discussing. It, it effectively merges with the existing lot. Uh, so it, it's going to be in their name. It's going to be obviously adjacent to the existing lot. And so, and so it's not it's not a standalone buildable lot, and it never will be. It's it's, it's part of the lot, and then you've got the existing lot. There's sufficient frontage, and there would be without it, but it it is sufficient. May I uh, may I just say something here? It is not a separate and unique lot. The way I understand it, that one A gets combined in with one. And I believe that 1A was presented just for purposes of delineating that area. That, 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 that would then answer the question and makes it entirely legitimate. Yeah. yeah, but that was not clear from the presentation. Yeah, okay. Uh, I Thank think you. Denise, Denise makes a good point that, and it's probably why those front yards were so close to 75 feet because it leaves the new enlarged one also able to be a, Two lots. Yes, we all saw that. Okay. Anybody else put their hands up? I don't see anyone, Mr. Chair. Okay, Kelsey, thank you. All right, I'll uh, entertain a motion to adjourn. So oh. moved. <laughs> I heard it in stereo, okay. Yeah. I'm going on vacation. <laughs> <laughs> I'll let Denise move and I'll second. Okay, Denise moves. Five seconds. Um, Denise, all in, um, on the motion. Aye. Um, Aye. Harry. Harry, hello. Aye. Aye. I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. Uh, Peter. Aye. And I'll vote in favor. Uh, motion meeting adjourned. It is. Um, uh, 8 13. It's after 8. And uh, Peter, have a great vacation. We'll miss you. But uh, thank you much. I may I may phone in. Ooh. Oh, yeah. O o only if you have a drink with uh, yeah, we'll see. pineapple or something. Yeah, an umbrella. I'll need yeah. a good background. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Kelsey. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Bye bye. Good night, everyone. Bye, Toby.